chapter four, communication and documentation. Two very important components. <clears throat> so we, it is important that we know how to communicate with our colleagues, how we know to communicate with the patient. And also it's very important that we know how to document information based on our um, assessment findings and treatment. And that's what this chapter will cover. All right, introduction. Communication is the transmission of information to another person. It can be verbal or nonverbal through body language. Verbal communication skills are important. It enables you to get a critical information and coordinate with other responders and interact with other healthcare professionals. Documentation. Things that need to be documented, the patient's permanent medical record. It demonstrates appropriate care was delivered, so if the documentation is good and thorough, it indicates that your assessment and management was thorough for the patient. It helps others in the patient's future care, so if you have good documentation, I can, the doctor can look at your findings, and then start their assessment and management and compare them to what was the initial presentation. And it can show whether or not the patient is trending up or trending down. Complete patient records. It guarantees proper transfer of responsibility and it comply with requirements of health departments and law enforcement agencies fulfill your organization's administrative needs. Computer, radio, and telephone communication. These are the methods utilized to communicate. It's a link, the EMT, the, the, these communication methods link the EMT to EMS, fire department, and law enforcement. You must know what your system can and cannot do and how to use a system efficiently and effectively. Therapeutic communication. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Therapeutic communication uses various communication techniques and strategies. It can be both verbal and nonverbal. It encourages patients to express how they feel, and it achieves a positive relationship with each patient. The Shannon Weaver communication model, it entails a sender. The sender takes a thought. That thought is encoded into a message. Then send, the message is then sent to a receiver. The receiver decodes the message and sends a feedback to the sender. Can read up on that. I'm not, not gonna go too much into that. Um, factors and strategies that to consider during communication, um, developmental age of the patient, body language, clothing, culture, education, environment, eye contact, facial expression, sex, posture, voice, tempo, volume. Age, culture, and personal experience can influence how a person communicates. Body language and eye contact are greatly affected by culture. In some cultures, expressing emotion is a weakness. In other cultures, it is, a impol it is impolite to look away while speaking. Tone, pace, and volume of language reflect mood of the person and perceive importance of the message. 
ethnocentrism is considering your own cultural values more important than those of others. Cultural imposition is forcing your values onto others. You need to be neutral in your thought process and communication. Body language provides more information than words alone. Even without exchanging any words, you should be able to tell the mood of your patient. And pay attention to your body language as well. Facial expressions, body language, and eye contact are powerful communication tools. They help people understand messages being sent. And if these messages are not being sent up, um, properly, they can be misinterpreted. So as I said, be aware of your body language, be aware of the way you're communicating with your patient and how you interact with your patient. When treating a potentially hostile patient, be aware of your own body language, so nonverbal communication. Stay calm and try to defuse the situation. Assess the safety of the scene. Do not assume an aggressive posture. Make good eye contact, but do not steer. Speak calmly, confidently, and slowly. Never threaten the patient, either verbally or physically. And be aware of your safe space, as I would call it. So your arm's length or two times your arm's length is your safe space. If somebody aggressive starts to breach that space, it means you can get hit. And once your safe space is breached, you cannot put yourself in a position of disadvantage. So if somebody who is showing signs of aggression breaches my safe space, Let's say I was um, squatting and assessing a patient, then I would have to get up because I would be in a position of disadvantage. So you need to be mindful of that. Once your safe space is breached, then you cannot square up with the person that is aggressive. So if somebody is in a, at a distance where they can hit you, you cannot square up with them. You have to allow that person to follow you. By allowing the person to follow you, they have to set themselves to hit you if they're going to attack you. And then you now have an advantage. So it's important to know that. And if your safe space is breached, your hands should never be below your waist. These are very important things to consider. So physical factors, literal noise or sounds in the environment, lighting, distance, or physical obstacles may affect your communication. Cultural norms often dictate the amount of space or proximity between people when communicating. Gestures, body movement, and attitude towards patients are critically important. Asking questions is a fundamental aspect of pre-hospital care. So this is a verbal communication. You will have to communicate with your patient. That's how you're gonna find out what's wrong if they can com communicate with you. Open-ended questions require some level of detail. Use whenever possible. Example, what seems to be bothering you today? What's your reason for calling EMS? Um, what's going on with you today? How can I assist you? Close-ended questions can be answered in a very short in very short responses. Responses sometimes a single word. Use if patients cannot provide long answers. Example: Are you having trouble breathing? Just give me a yes or a no. I'm not seeing this slide clearly. Um, I don't know what's wrong on my end, but I'm not able to see this slide. 
when you review it, um, definitely read up on it. It's communication tools. Not seeing it clearly. All right, interviewing techniques. When interviewing a patient, consider using touch to show caring and compassion. Use consciously and sparingly. Avoid touching the torso, chest, and face unless it is absolutely necessary. Interviewing, interviewing techniques to avoid. Um, avoid providing false assurance or reassurance, giving unsolicited advice, asking leading or biased questions, talking too much, interrupting, using why questions, using authoritative language, speaking, in professional jargon. So you definitely need to talk to the patient in a way that they can understand what it is that you're saying. Presence of family, friends, and bystanders. Friends and family may be valuable during the patient interview process. Allow the patient to answer, even if well-meaning family members attempt to answer for the individual. Do not be afraid to ask others to step aside for a moment. They will sometimes answer for the patient, but based on the circumstances, you may require a direct response from the patient. And that would be if you need to ascertain the patient's level of consciousness. Now, golden rules. Make and keep eye contact at all times. Or, I, uh, or as I would say, watch the center line of the patient. Provide your name and use the patient's proper name. Tell the patient the truth. Use the language the patient can understand. So don't get complicated with the big me medical terms. Break it down that they can understand. Be careful what you say about the patient to others. Be aware of your body language. Body language is extremely important. Um, try not to stand over the patient. Always try and get down to the level of the patient. Speak slowly, clearly, and distinctly. If the patient is hard of hearing, face the patient so that he or she can read your lips. Don't shout off after the, the patient, so don't raise your voice. That's not gonna solve the problem. You can use your stethoscope as an amplifier or use an additional stethoscope as an amplifier. You put the, the earpiece in the patient's ear and speak. Allow the patient time to answer or respond, act and speak in a calm, confident manner. Emotional intelligence. The ability to understand and manage your emotions and properly respond to others' emotions. It's a very difficult thing to do, and it's something that you will have to work on over time, right? It's something that I definitely need to work on over time. Um, slowly, there, there have been changes, but there are still things I need to work on. It helps with diffusing conflict, building rapport, communicating effectively, and managing difficult situation. So you don't need to know to deal with certain emotions if they come your way. And I mean, remaining calm. And if you have nothing positive to say, say nothing. Um, you will get um, aggression you, or you can get aggression and um, family members can be angry at you. And I mean, it's a loved one. We don't really know what type of emotion is going to surface and you have to be prepared for it. And as I always said to EMTs, don't wear your emotions on your sleeve. If you're too sensitive, EMS is not your cup of tea. So EMS is not for persons that are overly sensitive 
or get offended easily. Now, attributes of emotional intelligence, self-awareness, very important, self-regulation, motivation, empathy, social skills. These are things that we continually have to work on because um, everybody's different and you have to learn to adjust to people's emotions and emotions are dictated by circumstances, whether it's past experience or present experiences. But it's something that we have to continually build on. We're not going to get it perfect just like that. It's a continual um, development process. Improving emotional intelli intelligence, assess how you react to a stressful situation. And there has to be a balance. My, my problem at this stage is I am, I am not an emotional person anymore. I don't want to say I'm not emotional, I just don't show emotions. So I'm very difficult to read and I'm very blunt and straightforward. And as a result of that, persons are easily offended at times. But there are times when you have to be direct. There are times when you have to be blunt. And uh, when it comes to my interaction with students, I don't like to give students a false sense of security or a false sense of hope. So if you're not doing well, I'm going to tell you that you're not doing well. If you're doing well, I'm going to tell you that you're doing well. And if you're not going to pass, I'm going to tell you you're not going to pass. I'm a direct person. So being direct um, is not appropriate in all settings. So there are times when we have to be diplomatic, whether it's interaction with the patient or, or team members. For instance, you have a scene, a team member has been given a task and they're not doing that task appropriately, you can just fly off the handle, you know? We are do, you know, do that properly, leave that alone. That can't work, that's very unprofessional. So you have to be diplomatic in your approach. A, um, get the, the um, stretch already. Let me take over that from you, right? So sometime it is necessary to be diplomatic. And uh, what I've learned is that if you have nothing positive to say, don't say anything at that point. But just keep in mind that I am direct and you will get that directness because it's necessary for me to be direct with my students because I liked the true nature or personalities of my students come out when they are pressured. So that's where I'll see the, the true personalities. So it's necessary, but it's nothing personal. Take responsibilities for your actions. Consider how your actions will affect others. Very important. And it, it might seem like a simple statement, but it's extremely important. So whatever decision you make as a responder, you need to consider the consequences of your actions. So if, you're, if you choose to not be up to date, there is a consequence for that. If you choose to make up vital signs, and put on your report, there's a consequence. So always think about how your actions can affect others, especially your patient. Continuing with emotional intelligence, behavioral change, changes steer, steer away, steer away model. Um, that's something you can look up developed by the FBI to man manage hostage situations, um, adapted for crisis management. It employs active listening, display empathy, 
build a report, exert influence, initiate behavioral or behavior change. You can look it up. Um, not something I'm gonna tell you you need to learn for additional information. Communicating with older patients. You're gonna have to be patient with your geriatric population. So identify yourself, always identify yourself to your patient. That's the first thing you do. Always introduce yourself. Hello, sir. Hello, ma'am. My name is Mr. Rufus. I'm a paramedic. This is my partner, Mr. Barnett. What's your name, ma'am? Okay. How can we assist you today? So always introduce yourself. Present yourself as a competent, confident, and caring. And be mindful of your body language because you might think that you're confident and your body language showing something different. Do not assume that an older patient is senile or confused. So don't jump to assumptions. You may encounter hostility, irritability, and some confusion. Do not assume this is a normal behavior. Approach an older patient slowly and calmly. Allow plenty of time for the patient to respond to your questions. You're gonna need a lot of patience and you may end up spending a lot of time on that scene. Watch for signs of confusion, anxiety, or impaired hearing or vision. The patient should feel confident that you are in charge and that everything possible is being done for him or her. Be patient. Older patients often do not feel much pain. They may not be fully aware of important changes in their body systems you must be especially vigilant for objective changes. When possible, give the patient time to pack a few personal items before leaving for the hospital. Locate hearing aids, glasses, and dentures before departure. Older patients are often worried about the safety of their home, valuable items, and pets. I can remember. In my field experience, I had a geriatric patient. It took us roughly over two hours before we left that location because I, I had to find his sheets, his, his pillows, feed his pet, uh, make sure the lights are off, lock up the house properly, and then we departed. So yes, it can happen. When communicating with children, fear is most obvious and severe in children. Your method of communication will be based on your age of development. Children may be frightened by your uniform, the ambulance, a crowd of people gathered around them. Let a child keep a favorite toy, doll, security, blanket, and the service that I was working with, we had a section in the ambulance that where we had um, toys that we can give to our pediatric, the young pediatric population. If possible, have a family member or friend nearby. That's going to be important. If practical, let the parent or guardian hold the child during evaluation and treatment. Be honest. Children easily see through lies or deception. Tell the child ahead of time if something will hurt. Respect the child's modesty. Speak in a professional, friendly way. Maintain eye contact, position yourself at the child's level. Communicating with hearing impaired patients. Most have normal intelligence and are not embarrassed by their disability. Position yourself so the patient can see your lips. 
um, hearing aids might be important. Be careful that they are not lost during an accident. They may be forgotten if the patient is confused. Ask family about the use of hearing aid. Steps to take to efficiently communicate with patients who are hard of hearing. Have paper, pen available. If the patient can read lips, face the patient and speak slowly and distinctly, never show. Um, listen carefully, ask short questions and give short answers. Learn from simple sign languages. No, no issues in doing that. Um, communicating with visually impaired patients. Ask the patient if he or she can see at all. Visually impaired patients are not necessarily completely blind. Expect the patient to have normal intelligence. Explain everything you are doing as you are doing it. Stay in physical contact with the patient as you begin your care. If the patient can walk to the ambulance, place his or her hand on your arm and guide them. Transport mobility aids such as cane with the patient to the hospital. If you move their furniture around, make sure you reset it because they are accustomed to navigating their environment based on where certain things are located in their environment. Some may have guide dogs. They are easily identified by special harnesses. If possible, transport the dog with a patient. This will alleviate stress for both patient and dog. Otherwise, arrange for care of the dog. Non-English speaking patients. You must find a way to obtain a medical history. It might not be possible in, all, in um, some cases, but Definitely try. Find out if the patient speaks some English, use short, simple questions, point to body parts, sorry, point to parts of the body, have a family member or friend interpret. And if you're not able to get information, focus on the ABCs. Consider learning some common phrases in another language that is used in your area. Pocket cards that show the pronunciation of terms are available. Use a smartphone app or website to help you translate. Remember to request a translator at the hospital. Mission critical communications. Communications where disruption will result in failure of the task at hand. Shared mental model. This is another model you can look at. The mental model is a picture, sorry, is the picture an individual has in their head of what is going on. All team members must share a mental model. So you must have a mental um, construct in your head in terms of what you think is happening. And that will guide your approach. Shared mental module, questions to answer. What is the focus priority for this patient? What is the history of prior care? What is the patient's current state? How is the patient presenting to you now? What is the patient's immediate needs? What do I need to do for the patient based on their current presentation? Patient care handover. So as an EMT, you will be required to hand over your patient. Effective communication is essential to efficient, effective, and appropriate patient care. Transfer of pertinent patient information and responsibility for patient care. That's the purpose. So handovers are necessary for proper transfer of important information about your patient and what type of additional care need to be done or what type of care need to be maintained. Giving the handover report, initiate eye contact, manage the environment, and there might be multiple persons waiting on you, especially 
if you're working outside of Jamaica, you might have a lot of persons waiting on you in the ER to get that report or handover. Initiate eye contact, manage the environment, minimize noise, interruptions, and distractions. Ensure the ABCs. And really, when you're handing over, it is what, what the patient told you. So who is your patient? What did the patient tell you? What did you observe based on the patient presentation? What you did based on the patient presentation? How did the patient respond to that? So that's that's really what you need to, to give in your handover. And if it's a critical patient, you must include the ABC findings. Must. Provide a structure report, the SBAR situation, background, assessment, recap, treatment. SBAT situation, background, assessment, treatment. And if you can remember these acronyms, as I say, what did the patient tell you or how did the patient um, present? What did the patient tell you? What were your findings? What you did based on your findings? How did the patient respond to treatment? That's the, 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 the core of your handover. Provide documentation. Should include the patient's priority condition, prior care, current state, and immediate needs. Receiving the handover report, maintain eye contact, manage the environment, ensure understanding, summarize, get a supplementary patient documentation. So you may have to get a handover for you're picking up a patient from a, a medical facility to transport them somewhere. So you may be given a handover before you take over that patient. And you may have to review some of the patient's documentation. Never take a patient that is unstable. So if a patient is grossly unstable, do not take that patient. That patient needs to be stabilized before they can be transported. No written communication and documentation. Patient care report or PCR, also known as a pre-hospital care report. It's a legal document. It records all care from dispatch to hospital arrival. There are two types of PCRs. You have written, and written is more utilized in Jamaica. And you have electronic. The electronic format is what is used more outside of Jamaica. And that is becoming the standard. PCR serves six functions. Um, continuity of care, compliance and legal documentation, administrative information is taken from the PCR, reimbursement, it is an education tool, data collection for continuous quality improvement and research. Very important. Information collected on the PCR include the patient's chief complaint. That was that's the reason for activating EMS. The mechanism of injury, which would be specific to trauma, the nature of illness, which would be specific to a medical issue, the patient's level of consciousness or mental status, vital signs, initial and ongoing assessment, patient demographics, transport information. <clears throat> information collected on a PCR. Administrative information gathered from a PCR include when the incident was reported, the EMS unit that was notified, when that EMS unit arrived on the scene, when that EMS unit left the scene, um, when the EMS unit arrived at the receiving facility, patient care was transferred and the unit is back in service. 
all of that information is captured on the PCR. So you have traditional written form with check boxes and narrative section. I have the computerized version. Now standardized narrative formats. So your organization will decide on the um, approach for your narratives when you're gonna write the narrative portion of your report. It can be the chart method, which is the one that I commonly utilize. I'm not saying that you should use the chart method. You have chronological order, which goes from beginning to end. You have chart method and you have soap method. Whichever your organization um, decides on, go with it. But there can't be, it can't be that you are using chart <clears throat> and then somebody else in your organization is using SOAP and somebody else is using chronological. It needs to be a standard, standardized approach. Chart method, the chart C is chief complaint or chief concern. Um, H, HX, history, A, assessment, Rx or T, that's a treatment. The so Rx is treatment and the T is transport. That's a chart method. The SOAP method is subjective. Subjective would be what the patient tells you. Objective would be based on your observation. And then you have your assessment findings and your plan based on your assessment findings. All narrative sections should contain time of events, assessment findings, emergency medical care provided, changes in the patient after treatment, observation at the scene, final patient disposition, refusal of care if necessary, staff personal continued care. Health information exchange or exchanges. This improves sharing of data between EMS and other healthcare providers. It allows access to relevant health data, unnecessary duplication of effort in data entry, access to patient outcomes, uh, sorry, access to patient outcomes related to hospital care contribution and, and access to electronic health information on a regular basis and during a disaster. Most HIEs follow the SAFR framework, search, hospital, and other records. Alert notifies hospitals of incoming patients. File incorporates data directly into the patient's health records, reconcile, outcomes and other data provided to EMS agencies for billing and continuous quality improvement. Reporting errors. If you leave something out or record it incorrectly, do not try to cover it up. Falsification results in poor patient care, may result in suspension and or legal action. So don't make things up. If you didn't do it, you just didn't do it. Do not put lies in your report. If you discover an error as you are writing your report, draw a single horizontal line through the error, initial it, and write the correct information next to it. If an error is discovered after you submit your report, follow the same process. Documenting refusal of care a common source of lawsuits. Our documentation is going to be crucial in these situations. Document, document any assessment findings and emergency med medical care given. Have patients sign a refusal of care form. Have family members, police officers, or bystanders also sign as witness and complete your PCR. Special reporting situations. 
depending on the local requirements, gunshot wounds, dog bites, some infectious diseases, suspected physical or sexual abuse, multiple casualty incident or MCIs. Communication system and equipment. We're gonna look at the communication system and equipment. Um, I'll be sending a, a handout on this particular section, so I'm not gonna go into too much detail. Radio and telephone communication links you and your team with other members of the EMS, fire, and law enforcement community. It helps the entire team work together more effectively. We provide an important layer of safety and protection. Base station radios contains a transmitter and a receiver in a fixed place. Two-way radios consist of a transmitter and a receiver. A dedicated line, also known as a hotline, is used for specific point-to-point -point contact. Mobile and portable radios. Mobile radio is installed in a vehicle and it is used to communicate with the dispatcher and your medical director or medical control. Ambulances often have more than one. Portable radios are handheld devices. They are essential at the scene of, a, of an um, MCI. Helpful when away from ambulance to communicate with your dispatch, another unit or medical director or medical control. A repeater base system. A repeater is a special base station radio. It receives messages and signals on one frequency and automatically retransmit them on a second frequency. It allows two mobile or portable units that cannot reach each other directly to communicate using its greater power and antenna. Right, so, and this diagram depicts that. Digital equipment telemetry allows electronic signals to be converted into coded audible signals. Signals can be transmitted by radio or telephone to a receiver with a decoder at the hospital. Data from cardiac monitors can be transmitted by a Bluetooth enabled mobile devices. And most of the electronic reporting devices are linked to the cardiac monitor. So whatever information is recorded on the cardiac monitor, it's transferred to the reporting device and that can be sent to the receiving facility. Cellular satellite telephones. E EMTs often communicate with receiving facilities by cellular telephone, simple, low power, portable radios. And that is the cheapest method of communication. Satellite phones, sat phones are another option. A scanner is a radio receiver that scans across several frequencies. Conversations can be easily overheard. Other communication equipment. Ambulances usually have an external public address system. EMS systems may use a variety of two-way radio hardware. It can be simplex, which is push to talk, release to listen. It can be duplex, which is simultaneously talk and listen. It can be multiplex, which utilizes two or more frequencies. Now we have med channels that are reserved for EMS use. Trunking. Trunking system assign many frequencies. An interoperable communication system allows all of the agencies involved to share valuable information in real time. Mobile data terminals inside ambulance receive data directly from dispatch center 
and it allowed for expanded communication capabilities. Radio communications. The Federal Communication Commission or FCC regulates all radio operations in the United States. It allocates specific radio frequencies, it licenses call signs, it establishes licensing standards and operating specification, specifications. It establishes limitations for transmitter output and monitor radio operation. Responding to a scene. So if we're responding to a scene, the dispatcher receives and determine the relative importance of the 911 call. So the call comes into a dispatch center, which utilizes a universal, um, well, I can't say universal, but utilizes a um, national um, emergency call number assign appropriate EMS response unit. So when the dispatcher receives information on the call, they will determine what type of response is necessary and dispatch that response while keeping the call on the line to provide any necessary instructions or to gather any additional information that might be beneficial to the responding um, team. The dispatcher selects, the dispatcher selects, dispatches, and directs the appropriate EMS response units. The dispatcher coordinates with other public safety services, and it pro the dispatcher provides emergency medical instruction to the telephone caller. I mentioned a lot of this previously. EMTs report on any problems that took place during a run to the dispatcher. EMTs inform the dispatcher upon arrival at the scene. So once your unit has arrived, you will contact dispatch and say unit four on location. And you note your time. Communication with medical control and hospitals. The principal reason for radio communication is to facilitate communication between you and your medical director or medical control. Medical control may be located at the receiving hospital, at another facility, or sometimes even in another city or state. Consulting with medical control serves several purposes. It notifies the hospital of an incoming patient. It provides an opportunity to request advice or orders from medical control. And it advises the hospital of special situations that they need to prepare for. Giving a patient report. The report commonly includes the following 10 elements. So when you're writing a report, these are elements that it should include your unit identification and level of service services, any special alert indicated by the patient's condition, the receiving hospital and your estimated time of arrival or ETA, the patient's age and gender, the patient's chief complaint. Oh, this slide is faint. I think it has to do with how the platform converts the slide. Barely seeing this slide. Um, you won't have any this issue when you access the slide directly. The report commonly includes the following 10 elements continuing. A brief history of the patient's problem, a brief report of physical findings, a brief summary of the care or treatment provided, a brief description of the patient's response to treatment, any questions or orders from the receiving facility. Now, the role of your medical control. It used to be called medical director. It's now referred to as medical control. Medical control is either offline, indirect, or online direct. And I've explained the difference previously. You may need to call medical control for permission to administer certain treatments to determine transport destination of patients 
to stop treatment and or not transport a patient. In most areas, medical control is provided by physicians working at the receiving facility or hospital. Many variations have developed across the, the country, freestanding center, individual physician. Calling medical control. There are a number of ways to control access on ambulance to hospital channels. The dispatch, the dispatcher monitors and assigns appropriate clear medical control channels. Centralized medical emergency dispatch or resource coordination centers exist for this purpose. Calling medical control continued, be precise and deliver important information. You need to give your medical control a clear picture of what it is that you have assessed and found, and they will be able to guide you accordingly. So it needs to be very clear in terms of what it is you are you are seeing based on your assessment and what it is that you need guidance with. Never use quotes unless directed to do so by local protocols, and it must be codes that are universally accepted. Repeat orders back word for word and then receive confirmation. Do not blindly follow an order that does not make sense to you. So sometimes your medical control may have not heard clearly what it is that you said about the patient and your instructions might not be appropriate. If you think it's not appropriate, don't do it. You are the person interacting directly with the patient. So don't do something that you know is unsafe for your patient or can cause further harm to the patient. Information regarding special situation. You may initiate communication with hospital to advise them of an extraordinary call or situation. An example of special situations would include hazardous material situation, rescues in progress, multiple casualty incidents. Keep several points in mind. The earlier the notification, the better. Provide an estimate of the number of patients and identify any special needs. Follow your system's plan. Maintenance of radio equipment. Like other EMS equipment, radio equipment must be serviced. At the beginning of your shift, check your radio equipment. Radio equipment may fail during a run. Follow your backup plan, and it's usually a cell phone. Um, and that would be the end of this chapter.